Okay, this is concept three notes, and we're going to talk about the endocrine system. So just a little overview. The overall function of the endocrine system is to interact with your nervous system and to coordinate and control the activities in your body. And the main player here are hormones. So your endocrine system is all about the hormones. And hormones are just chemical messengers that are secreted by cells into extracellular fluids, um, particularly blood. So they're traveling through blood to regulate functions like our reproduction, growth and development, um, the balance of nutrients in our blood, such as blood glucose levels, um, metabolism in your cells, and even we'll talk about too when we get to our protection unit, um, mobilizing your body's defenses in your immune system. The study of endocrine um, system is called endocrinology and has a bunch of different sub-branches. It really overlaps, like the nervous system, with pretty much every other system since it's in charge of co coordinating and controlling those other symptom, um, systems. Excuse me. This is a diagram similar to something I showed you in concept two of our of unit one, Introduction to Anatomy. Just showing some of the different types of cell signaling and cell communication methods. There's autocrine or self-signaling, paracrine signaling for nearby, um, juxtacrine signaling too isn't shown here. But endocrine signaling is again using hormones. So a cell, a signaling cell is secreting a hormone. It's traveling through the blood a farther, far distance and then um, being received at a target cell. So how does this work different in terms of how it does control and coordination from the nervous system? Well, the nervous system uses action potentials and neurotransmitters to send signals and communicate. The endocrine system is using hormones released in the blood. Now, if you remember from concept one, we talked about how some chemicals can be neurotransmitters in some instances when they're secreted by a, or released by a nerve cell. Um, and then they can also be hormones if they're released into like, like from a gland, like say into the blood. So they can work both ways. The nervous system traditionally is causing immediate responses, whereas the endocrine system has more delayed responses. Nervous systems are more short term and endocrine are more long term. The nervous system works by acting at specific locations that the axon is delivering a signal to, which tends to be shorter distance. Whereas the endocrine system is acting at target locations that the hormones diffuse to via the blood. So they're diffusing through the blood to get somewhere and thus they travel long distances. But both work together to regulate, integrate, and coordinate your body's functions on a cellular level. So they're extremely important. The endocrine system utilizes glands distributed throughout your body to secrete substances. Um, there's two types of glands. Exocrine, exocrine glands are externally secreting. They release non-hormonal substances like sweat or saliva or like your tears through ducts um, to your body surface. So we talked about the lacrimal apparatus in concept two of the eye that releases tears. So exocrine, um, those are called, those are exocrine glands. We mentioned this um, in unit one, intro to anatomy. Um, and then we'll talk more about exocrine, gland, exocrine excuse me, glands when we get to the integumentary system in Unit 6. But I wanted to touch on those because that is different from the endocrine glands that we will be focusing on in this concept, which are internally secreting. So they are ductless. Instead, they release hormones into their surrounding tissue fluid like blood. Endocrine glands include the pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, and pineal glands. And then there are other structures that um, are not solely glands, that are organs that do other things, but they also secrete hormones. Um, and that's like the hypothalamus, the pancreas, gonads, which are the testes in males and um, the ovaries in females, and then also the placenta. Now, that doesn't mean that these are the only structures with which hormones are secreted. There are endocrine cells scattered throughout your entire body that can secrete hormones, but these are the major glands and structures that we are going to be covering um, 
as we do the discovery stations and label our big body diagram. These are the big players. So that's what in class we're going to stop and do now. Um, we're going to walk through each of the glands and talk about some different hormones they secrete and then the effects that those have at different target cells. But for the sake of the video, we're just going to keep plowing through the notes. All right, this diagram should look familiar from Unit 1, um, Concept 2, when we talked reviewed feedback loops and homeostasis. But um, the endocrine system specifically uses negative feedback mechanisms um, to control the synthesis and the release of hormones, meaning the target um, slash effector organs response will then feed back and then inhibit further hormone production so that we can keep things within a normal range. Hopefully you remember in this type of diagram, the receptor is just whatever sensory organ or structure or cells receiving a stimulus. Stimulus is just the action that's going to evoke some sort of response. Our effector or organ or target cell is just the organ structure cell that's going to do some sort of response or action. So brief note on stimuli, on stimuli. There are three types of stimuli that will trigger endocrine glands to then make and release hormones. So they'll trigger some response in these um, endocrine glands to do that. And that those are humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, and hormonal stimuli. So we're going to talk through each one. Humoral stimuli is when a hormone a release is caused by altered levels of critical ions or nutrients. This is our simplest endocrine tr control because it's just kind of controlled by what's going on in the surrounding environment. So, an example, um, like we can see in this picture, um, let's say there's low calcium ion concentration in your capillary blood. That is a stimulus that will evoke a response um, in the parathyroid gland, and that response is the parathyroid gland will then secrete PTH, which is the parathyroid hormone, which causes an increase in blood calcium um, ion concentration. Other examples, this is how... Um, Insulin works in response to an increase in blood glucose to keep your blood sugar regulated. And this is also how aldosterone um, regulates or responds to low sodium or high potassium in the blood. So just a response to the nutrients or ions surrounding it in, or in the surrounding environment. Neural stimuli, um, these cause hormones to be released um, or the hormones are released due to some sort of neural input. So for example, what we see pictured here is how the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the endocrine system in response to stress, which we talked about in concept one. So the stimulus would be like action potentials that are sent from the preganglionic sympathetic um, nerve fibers. Their target or effector would be the adrenal gland. And then the response is the adrenal medulla and the adrenal gland then secretes epinephrine and, no, and norepinephrine in order to aid in the fight or flight response. And then last is just hormonal stimuli. So this is when hormone release caused by another hormone kind of instigating it. And this causes really rhythmic hormone release. It's kind of, you know, almost like a hormone cascade, if you will. So um, an example in this picture, huge player in this, you should have seen in the big body diagram and the discovery stations, is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases hormone, hormones that stimulate a lot of different glands, um, but especially the anterior pituitary gland. Um, so we see that here. An example would be the anterior pituitary gland. And then the anterior pituitary gland secretes hormones that can go on and stimulate other glands. Um, so it kind of creates this little cascading effect. Now, that has to do with kind of our stimuli. But what about the receiving of the hormone? Hormones can only alter the activity of target cells with specific receptors for them. So for instance, if we look at this picture, this cell cannot be a target cell for this secreting cell's hormones because it doesn't have the appropriate receptors for it like this one does. The target cell must have the specific receptor on or within its membrane or the hormone cannot bind to it. A response then can only in the target cell also depends on, so it has to have the specific receptor, but it also depends on the blood levels of the hormone the relative numbers of receptors for this specific hormone, and the strength or affinity of the binding 
between a hormone and its receptor. And receptors are dynamic structures. That means they, they are constantly changing. For instance, if you have prolonged exposure to high hormone concentrations, this can result in a desensitization in your target cells. And they can do something called downregulate and decrease the number of their receptors for that hormone because they're desensitized. On the opposite end of that, consistently low levels of a hormone can cause a target cell to make more receptors to try to take in that hormone, which is called upregulation. Hormones also influence receptors for other hormones. So for example, progesterone, progesterone downregulates estrogen receptors in your uterus, um, and estrogen can upregulate progesterone receptors which can then enhance the target cell's ability to respond to that progesterone. So a lot of interaction here at the receptor level. Most target cells have multiple types of receptors for different hormones on them, and this can yield hormone interaction in those target cells. So such as permissiveness, when a hormone can't do its job fully without another hormone potentially present. So for example, like I was just mentioning, your reproductive system hormones can't do their jobs unless the thyroid hormone has stimulated reproductive development in a timely manner. Synergism is where more than one hormone produces the same effects of the target cell and then that can cause an amplified combined effect. So both glucagon and epinephrine cause the liver to release glucose to the blood. So if they're both acting at the same time on the same cell, they can release way more glucose than on their own on, at different cells. And then antagonism is just when one hormone actually opposes the action of the other. And the simplest example of this is with your blood glucose levels and how insulin lowers those and glucagon raises them. Now, the chemical structure of a hormone determines its solubility in water. And that is a big deal because it affects how it is transported, how these hormones get transported in the blood. Your blood is mainly water, so this is, this is relevant. It also affects how long it lasts, the hormone lasts before it's degraded, and what receptors it can then be received by. Can it be received by receptors on the surface of the cell? Can it pass through the plasma membrane, membrane and get to intracellular receptors? That all depends on the hormone's chemical structure. And in general, we see two types of chemical structures, amino acid based and steroids. So this picture is of um, epinephrine or adrenaline, which is an amino acid based protein. The red parts on the, those represent um, where hydroxyl groups are bonded and then the blue represents where an amino group is. And then these different functional groups are what um, determine the chemical properties of that hormone. But in general, amino acid-based hormones tend to be water-soluble and steroids tend to be lipid-soluble. Majority of hormones are amino acid-based and thus are water-soluble. And now we'll kind of talk through why does that matter? What's the difference between those? So here's the big differences. Lipid-soluble hormones include all of your steroid horm hormones and also the thyroid hormone. Water-soluble are all your amino acid-based hormones except the thyroid hormone. Um, the adrenal cortex, your gonads, and the thyroid gland are, secre are secreting these lipid-soluble steroid hormones, um, whereas all the other endocrine glands are secreting these water-soluble amino acid-based hormones. Lipid-soluble are not stored in secretory vesicles, but water-soluble are. Blood transport, um, in order for lipid-soluble hormones to be transported through the blood, they have to have plasma proteins because they um, are, blood is mainly water, and so they can't basically dissolve in that, whereas water-soluble can move freely through the blood. Half-life. Half-life is just the length of time for a hormone's blood level to decrease by half. Um, it's another way of kind of just saying how long it's going to last in the blood, um, lipid soluble have longer half lives than water soluble, which are shorter. And um, this is because your kidneys are really quick to remove water soluble ones from the blood. That's all. Now, lipid soluble, their receptors are usually intracellular, so within the cell, because lipid soluble hormones can travel through the plasma membrane, whereas water soluble have to be on the plasma membrane because they cannot go through it.
what happens when they get to the target cell. In general, lipid soluble ones, um, because they're intracellular, they immediately go in and they activate genes to create um, or to have new proteins synthesized. Whereas water soluble end up kind of starting a, a cascade. They, they use second messengers to initiate a signal transduction pathway, which again, we talked about in unit one, concept two, if you need to go back and have a refresher on that. And last, here's a picture that I think really helps kind of summarize those differences. Lipid soluble, again, is all your steroid hormones plus the thyroid one. You can see that the hormone is able to travel through the plasma membrane to an intracellular receptor and then immediately initiate a response um, to activate certain genes to transcribe mRNA, to translate that mRNA into a new protein. Whereas water soluble, which are the amino acid based hormones minus the thyroid hormone, they connect with receptors on the plasma membrane, and then that usually starts this little cascade, which requires energy to initiate a second messenger to start some sort of signal transduction pathway until we can get our response, or whatever that may be. That is the endocrine system.